a plane hit turbulence, causing the main engine to fail. The pilot quickly instructed the passengers to prepare for an emergency landing. Fear filled the air as everyone braced themselves for the worst. Among the frightened passengers, Alice's mind began to wander, contemplating the actions she had taken to conceal her past crimes. She questioned whether she deserved to die in a plane crash as a form of punishment. In her current life, Alice was known as Song Jai Zion, a renowned general surgeon and the youngest professor at the prestigious S Medical University. She possessed an exceptional surgical talent and dedicated herself to saving lives as a way to make amends for the wrongs she had committed in her previous life. However, despite her accomplishments, she often felt a deep longing for her family, even in her present existence. These sentiments intensified during moments of crisis, such as the turbulence on the plane. Alice couldn't help but believe that her time had come, and she would meet her end in the crash. However, fate had other plans. The plane managed to avoid disaster, and Alice awoke to find herself back in her previous life. The experience felt surreal, almost like a dream to her. Shortly after waking up, Alice's servant arrived to present her meal. However, the servant noticed a change in her demeanor, perceiving her to be quieter than usual. The servant, who harbored fear towards Alice due to her reputation as a formidable individual, considered her to be a sort of female monster, despite the fact that Alice hadn't committed many serious crimes in her younger years. Reflecting on her past, Alice vowed not to repeat the same mistakes and sought to lead a better life. Having spent ten days since returning to her previous life, the initial shock of the experience was gradually subsiding. Although she hadn't fully adjusted to her new circumstances, Alice was determined not to revert to the person she once was. Curious about the duration of her grounding, she inquired with her servant if it was the last day of her punishment, even though she remained unaware of the specific reasons for her ten-day grounding. Alice's servant informed her that her father wished for her presence at the family dinner. The dinner would include her father, stepmother, and her brothers, except for the first prince who held the position of deputy commander in the Holy Gun Knights organization. Alice felt a surge of happiness upon hearing this, as she had been separated from her family for thirty long years, enduring two reincarnations. Excitedly, she made her way to the dinner, eager to reunite with her beloved family members. As Alice entered the room, tears welled up in her eyes, overwhelming her with emotions. Concerned, her family assumed that her tears were a result of the recent grounding she had endured. They directed their frustration towards their father, blaming him for subjecting Alice to a ten-day punishment. Grace, the second son of the Roland family, approached Alice, embracing her and urging her not to cry. In response, Alice apologized sincerely, expressing her determination not to disappoint them. Grace, considering Alice to be a grown woman on the verge of engagement, encouraged her to stop sniveling. Alice's heart swelled with joy, realizing that her family was indeed alive, and that her reunion wasn't just a dream. Overwhelmed with love, she professed her adoration for them. However, her father, mother, and Grace were left bewildered, unable to comprehend the sudden change in Alice's behavior. Assuming she was unwell, her father asked for her forgiveness, though Alice understood that the fault lay within herself. She pleaded with her father, acknowledging that she may have caused him trouble or perhaps discarded something valuable or even lost her temper with a servant. Nevertheless, Alice reassured herself that she hadn't committed any significant crimes, even though her father had detected a notable transformation in her. Alice's peculiar behavior surprised her servants, leading them to doubt if she was truly the young lady of the household. However, her unmatched beauty reaffirmed her identity. Apologizing to the servants she had previously mistreated, Alice showed genuine concern for their health and well-being. This unexpected change in her demeanor made everyone wonder if something was amiss with her or if an angel had taken possession of her. The servant fervently prayed for the angel to stay with Alice, not wanting her newfound kindness to fade away. Alice prepared tea and presented it to her father, leaving him astonished as he never expected to have the chance to taste tea made by his own daughter. Delighted that her father enjoyed the flavorful tea, Alice expressed her filial devotion to him. In her previous life, Alice had dedicated significant effort to mastering the art of tea-making, hoping to catch the attention of a prince. However, she decided to keep her recent tea-making skills a secret, stating that she had only learned it recently for her own pleasure. She didn't want to burden her busy father with her pursuits and took her leave. Her father couldn't help but feel unsettled by the encounter. With ten years remaining until Alice's execution, she began to recall the significant events of her past preparing herself for the challenges ahead. She carefully analyzed each event, the death of her brother during the second Klin expedition, 
Her stepmother's demise due to a deteriorating illness, and the rebellion incited by the Tristan family, resulting in the extermination of her own Roland family, with her father ultimately being executed. Her eldest brother met the same fate for protecting her. The first Klin expedition witnessed the annihilation of the entire expedition army due to an unknown contagious disease, which also claimed the life of the reigning emperor. Duchess Hubble succumbed to advanced Parkinson's disease. Moreover, three cities in the southern region were quarantined due to a smallpox outbreak originating from the eastern region, causing a staggering death toll of 70,000. The fate of the country hinged on a disease they never anticipated. Alice pondered whether she would be able to save lives in such circumstances, reminiscing about the endemic in Londo, the capital of Puglia, which claimed the lives of 100,000 people. Alice pondered if her medical knowledge as a surgeon would enable her to save lives, despite her limited abilities, understanding that she could still make a difference. With this in mind, she made the decision to confide in her father about her desire to continue practicing medicine. However, as she contemplated this, a sense of something being amiss arose within her. Suddenly, she remembered that Prince Link and Alice had publicly announced their engagement during a birthday banquet in the year 283 of the Imperial Calendar. During the banquet, Grace, Alice's brother, expressed to their mother his belief that Alice was unsuitable to become the queen. He described her as someone who possessed selfish and willful tendencies, casting doubt on her suitability for such a role. While Alice was contemplating her brother's upcoming birthday in July, a sense of worry washed over her as she realized that she had only two months left before everything would take a downward turn. Just then, her stepmother entered the room and inquired about her appetite. Alice's response brought a smile to her stepmother's face as Alice referred to her as mother. However, her lack of appetite concerned everyone present. Alice explained that her melancholy stemmed from her brother's birthday. Upon hearing this, her father chuckled and assured her not to fret. He disclosed that he had discussed the matter with his majesty, and an announcement would be made regarding her engagement to the prince. However, Len, the eldest son, opposed the union, deeming Alice unsuitable to be with the royal prince. In his eyes, she lacked the qualities required of an empress who would act as the mother figure for all those in the empire. This disagreement between Len and Alice's father led to an outburst of anger, as her father was unable to defy the emperor's wishes. Alice engaged in a reasoned discussion with her brother Len, despite his harsh criticism. Deep down, she acknowledged that he was right about her unsuitability for the role of empress. This realization strengthened her determination to put an end to the engagement. She recognized that the prince had been unjustly punished for the wrongs she had committed, and it pained her to see him endure such unhappiness when he had no part in causing it. Grace, Alice's brother, attempted to convey to Len that Alice had recently displayed acts of kindness. However, Len, who had been closely observing her for 15 years, found it hard to believe in a sudden change in her behavior. Frustrated and feeling that his time was being wasted, Len resolved to return to the Nightwitch. Grace, however, advised Len to meet with Alice before his departure. With only two months remaining until the engagement, which was set to take place due to Alice's year-long love for the prince, she found herself in a predicament. Despite any reluctance she may feel now, she had previously made a fuss about the engagement, making it difficult for her to openly express her disinterest. Furthermore, the royal family would be hesitant to retract the engagement, as it would tarnish their honor. Marie, one of Alice's servants, arrived to serve her tea and noticed her troubled state. Seeking to uplift her spirits, Marie reassured Alice that everything would turn out fine. As Marie departed, Alice realized that simply sitting and worrying would not resolve the problem. She resolved to face the situation head-on and directly express her thoughts to the Emperor. On the day of Alice's audience with the Emperor, Marie inquired about the type of dress she should order from the designer for the occasion. However, Alice insisted on wearing her own clothes. This response surprised Marie, as Alice had always been known for ordering new dresses from top designers. Together, they made their way to the dressing room. An hour passed, yet they couldn't find the specific dress Alice had in mind. All the dresses they came across were excessively flashy, which reminded Alice of her principles from her previous life on Earth. She had always rejected anything flashy and instead focused on her ambition of becoming a surgeon. Alice preferred the comfort of a white coat, but she knew it wouldn't be appropriate to visit the emperor dressed as a doctor. She desired something simple yet sophisticated for the occasion. After some searching, she found a dress that, although not colorful, still accentuated her beauty. Her makeup was kept minimal, adding to her natural charm. Her father entered the room and informed her that the carriage was ready. 
they made their way to the palace. Along the journey, Alice repeatedly posed peculiar questions to her father, asking how he would react if she made a mistake or did something wrong. Perplexed by her unusual inquiries, her father urged her to unveil whatever she was hiding, assuring her of his forgiveness. However, Alice insisted that she hadn't done anything wrong, continuing to deny any wrongdoing. Upon their arrival at the palace, they found the emperor awaiting them in the Rose Garden. Warm greetings were exchanged, and the emperor graciously offered them seats. The reason for his summoning was his longing to see Alice's face, as it had been almost half a year since their last meeting. Alice couldn't help but recall that the emperor had no one to rely on within the palace. His kind words and presence always brought her comfort. She also remembered his final words to her in her previous life, though he hadn't been able to fulfill his dying wish. Alice noticed that the emperor's chronic illness from her past life still persisted in her present life, yet he skillfully concealed it behind a facade of smiles. The emperor, afflicted by a condition that caused impaired blood circulation, had long struggled with his health. Despite numerous medical examinations, a definitive diagnosis remained elusive, and his condition eventually worsened, leading to his current comatose state. Alice, with her keen medical knowledge and astute observations, noticed a faint scent of ketones coming from the emperor's body, an alarming sign that hinted at potential underlying issues. Understanding the urgency of the situation, Alice recognized that the political upheaval caused by the actions of the third prince could exacerbate the emperor's health crisis. She realized that if she could intervene and resolve the unrest, it might alleviate the stress and anxiety that could further compromise the emperor's well-being. Determined to make a difference, Alice resolved to act swiftly and decisively, harnessing her medical expertise and diplomatic skills to bring about a resolution that would protect both the kingdom's stability and the emperor's health. Even the emperor noticed the difference in her attire, and her father praised the positive changes she had been displaying, earning her praise from everyone in the mansion. The emperor, intrigued by these transformations, requested that she prepare him a cup of tea so he could experience it for himself. Alice promptly went to the kitchen and requested some eastern black tea and white tea. She skillfully brewed the tea, aiming to recreate the flavor the emperor used to enjoy. When the emperor tasted it, he was delighted to find that it closely resembled the tea brewed by the Qing ambassador in the past. Impressed by her exceptional skills, the emperor expressed his admiration for her excellent work. The emperor, feeling a tinge of jealousy towards Alice's father who had the privilege of enjoying her tea every day, requested that she visit him more often so she could brew tea for him as well. His happiness was evident, and he eagerly asked if she had anything to share. Just as Alice was about to speak up, the prince abruptly entered the room, causing her to pause her intentions and withhold what she wanted to say for the time being. Prince Linden entered the room and apologized for his late arrival. Alice greeted him, but he displayed a cold demeanor towards her. Prince Linden was the one Alice had once admired due to his handsome appearance and aloof manner, but her feelings for him were unrequited. Alice kindly offered Prince Linden a cup of tea, but he rejected it, viewing her as merely someone his father had instructed him to be engaged to. He asked Alice to leave, claiming that she was interrupting his studies. This hurt Alice deeply, and she felt determined to find a way to capture the prince's attention. Despite knowing that they were never meant to be together in the first place, Alice blamed herself for the situation. However, her heart no longer fluttered for the prince as it had done in the past, as thirty years had passed since then. Prince Linden explained the reason for his tardiness, citing a lengthy meeting with the Finance Council regarding the budget for the Krim expedition. The emperor was aware of the gravity of the issue, as the people had suffered greatly at the hands of the Krim Peninsula. After a thorough discussion, the emperor devised a strategy to address the situation by deploying the Romanov Second Squad. With their formidable strength of over 50,000 men, the emperor believed they would be capable of handling the situation adequately, particularly if the republic refrained from intervening. The emperor, emphasizing the need to balance the kingdom's finances, highlighted the importance of considering the strain that sending additional troops would place on their resources. Aware of the potential risks involved, Alice silently reflected on her past experiences, remembering how the ill-fated expedition had tragically taken her brother Chris' life. Although she had been too young to comprehend the full extent of the situation back then, the memories were etched deep within her consciousness. As the emperor carried on with the discussion, deliberating on matters of state, his gaze suddenly fell upon Alice, as if he had just noticed her presence in the room. Curiosity sparked in his eyes as he directed his attention towards her, seeking her unique insights and perspectives. Alice hesitated, unsure whether to voice her thoughts or remain silent. 
the weight of responsibility pressed upon her, as she pondered whether her words could truly make a difference in this crucial decision-making process. Alice hesitated to join the discussion, but the Emperor insisted on hearing her thoughts. She doubted whether she should voice her concerns, but her desire to save lives compelled her to speak up. She began by highlighting two crucial factors to consider in the war. Firstly, she emphasized the potential involvement of the Monsell Kingdom in the conflict, urging them to be wary of their participation rather than the Francolny Republic. Alice's father chimed in, explaining that the Monsell Kingdom had no direct connection to the Krim Peninsula and thus may not be inclined to intervene in the ethnic strife taking place there. Furthermore, the Monsell Kingdom is located inland and has no strategic interest in controlling the Black Sea. From a geopolitical perspective, they have no motive to actively participate in the war. However, the Monsell King is relying on Igris, a valuable resource, to gain recognition as the legitimate ruler. In order to secure the support of the Francolny Republic and legitimize his reign, he may resort to ambushing their men as a bargaining chip. It is important to consider the Monsell Kingdom's past actions and motivations in the context of this war. Part of the Francolny Empire, everyone at the table fell silent, skeptical of the idea that the Monsell Kingdom would take such actions. However, Alice pointed out that it was indeed a possibility. The prince, confident in the strength of his military, believed that they were the strongest in the world. He argued that the Monsell Kingdom could only send around 20,000 men to the peninsula. Alice countered by explaining that the Monsell Kingdom might not engage in direct face-to-face -face combat, thereby employing alternative tactics or strategies. Elise informed them about the possibility of the Monsell Kingdom changing their strategy and marching towards the Ukra Mountain instead of the peninsula. This would involve crossing the Donov River and heading directly to the mountain. It was known that the Ukra Mountain served as the sole entrance to the Grim Peninsula from the Romanov region in the west. Elise pointed out that if the Monsell Kingdom were to capture the Ukra Mountains, the troops on the peninsula would be cut off from their supply lines, leading to their eventual annihilation. The Emperor was perplexed as to why this scenario hadn't been considered earlier. He instructed one of his servants to inform the Chancellor that they would discuss the matter in general the following day. Additionally, he instructed Linden to go and confer with the Intelligence Council regarding surveillance. The Emperor marveled at Elise's ability to perceive the political landscape of the Empire, including its relationships with other countries, and the significance of the peninsula. Her comprehensive analysis resembled that of a brilliant strategist. The Emperor approached Marquess Elise's father and expressed his admiration for raising such an extraordinary daughter. Intrigued, he inquired about the second important factor to be mindful of during times of war. Marquess Elise responded that they should be cautious of diseases due to the differing temperatures in the peninsula environment compared to their own. While she couldn't pinpoint the exact disease, she advised them to be prepared in order to minimize the number of casualties. Curious about the measures to be taken, the Emperor asked for her recommendations. Marquess Elise suggested stocking an ample supply of medical resources and emphasized the significance of proper hygiene as the most crucial preventive measure. The Emperor was initially puzzled about the effectiveness of hygiene prompting Elise to explain how an unsanitary environment can lead to the spread of diseases if precautions are not taken. She further noted that the importance of proper hygiene had not yet been fully recognized in that era. The emperor was astonished by this insightful idea. The emperor inquired about Elise's source of knowledge regarding hygiene, and she informed him that she had learned it from the books on medicine she had been reading. Impressed by her understanding, the Emperor pledged to bestow upon her the prestigious Britio Insignia of Honor, also known as the Cross of Royalty. This esteemed accolade held the highest power and recognition within the Empire, granting Elise the title of Honorary Knight. Elise considered her own suggestion to be frivolous and unworthy of such a distinction, but the Emperor insisted on honoring her in this way. Shortly after, Elise presented the Emperor with the gift she had brought a rare incense from the nation of Cheng and a refreshing candle used by the nobles, known for its invigorating scent that uplifts one's spirit. During this exchange, the emperor confided in Elise about his ongoing fatigue. Elise's thoughts wandered to her previous life, where she speculated that the emperor's cause of death might have been the result of improper diagnosis and treatment of diabetes mellitus, a condition characterized by high blood sugar levels. She surmised that he might have suffered from acidosis when his blood sugar reached 1,000. Intrigued by her insights, the emperor questioned how she had acquired such knowledge. Elise explained that she had read about a disease with similar symptoms, although she couldn't recall its specific name. Determined to address the issue, she decided to discuss it with Baron, an excellent doctor. With Elise's intervention and consultation with Baron, 
The problem concerning the Emperor's disease was resolved. However, the matter of her engagement with Prince Linden remained unresolved.